autopsy um, and uh, becomes the ideal, essentially, more or less. Right. So that's the kind of conception Thank there. You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not just Augustine, it's, it's a whole, I mean, Augustine is just coming at the end of a whole culture of fixation on mastering passion. It's like the main kind of way that you're a Christian. Justin Martyr, he, he becomes a Christian because he said he watches the Christians die in the arena and they stand there stone-faced, he says, as the lions rip them to pieces. They make no cries, they just they're like statues. Says, well, this is the real deal, he says. I gotta become a Christian. <laughs> Anyways. But then that all ends up having and, if you, and you can see this too. See, uh, if, if faith is the main way that you interact with God, right? So the problem of sin isn't, so with Augustine the problem is this, God is the supreme good and then he makes a world that's a derivative good. And so when you enjoy our, del our delight in creative things, you're, you're distracting from how you should feel about God, right? So all your erotic desire should be directed at God. Uh, hence the reason they all read Psalm of Songs as uh, really about the soul and God, right? So, um, uh, and so forth. Um, but we have a whole number of them today. I mean, we've, we have contemporary Christian music, which, of course, you could just replace baby with Jesus, right? I mean, God is the most desirable thing, so desire him, yeah. right, in this sort of most eroticizing way. So when you enjoy any earthly things, essentially you're distracting from what you should be directing towards God. So God and, and creative things are inherently in a, in a kind of competition with each other for your desires. So a wife is going to get in your way. Having property is going to get in your way. Um, so you have to so leave the world. Monasticism now becomes an ideal. With Luther, the problem with sin is wrong faith. You trust in things that aren't God, okay? Um, so delighting in earthly things isn't a problem anymore, right? In fact, the kind of domesticity of um, uh, all those great passages about, you know, the, the greatness of having a family and just sort of living a normal earthly life that you get in the Old Testament come to the forefront again in the Reformation. The ideal then becomes enjoying earthly things. As long as you don't trust in them above God, you can delight in them, certainly. So, um, uh, and you don't then have this weird eroticizing concept of your relationship with God. So, so because faith uh, is not the love, this what Augustine would call caritas, uh, but it's faith that is the main category. So, um, so creation and God in that regard isn't aren't in, in competition anymore. So, anyways, yeah. So. Okay, so in the midst of all this as well, you have the beginnings of uh, the Peasants' War, which I'll uh, just um, sort of touch on briefly, and Thomas Munzer. Thomas Munzer um, was a, um, a priest who, and humanist who uh, studied at a whole bunch of different universities, and he interacted with Luther, and was a very enthusiastic supporter of Luther. In fact, he was, a, he was at the Leipzig debate, he traveled to Wittenberg and actually listened to many of Luther's lectures. Uh, but then he got to being kind of a crazy spiritualist. Ends up in this place called Mulhausen. Uh, and uh, he was at Zwickau for a while as well. And uh, starts th seeing, having dreams and visions. Uh, talks about the spirit speaking through him. And uh, he's able to get some popular support because one of the things that he attacks are the Franciscans. Uh, the Franciscans go around all the time. They're committed to poverty, absolute poverty. They believe that Christ was absolutely poor. He literally owned nothing, not even clothes on his own back, um, which doesn't make any sense. But nevertheless, <laughs> that's what they believe. So they, they go around, they beg everybody. Now, if you might imagine, in the ethos of early modern capitalism, this is not considered to be good form. Um, the beginnings of what Americans, uh, American historians call the free labor ideology, where everybody should work for their own bread, essentially, are starting with these people. And so it's like, these people are a complete nuisance. And so he's able to kind of drum up popular support against the Franciscan, they're begging, they're not earning their way. Like you, these early modern businessmen are, right? So, um, uh, anyways. So, uh, but he then gets more interested in other things, like starting this, again, a peasant's revolt. The, uh, and the peasant's revolt will purify Germany. And then once it's purified, then the kingdom of heaven will come. So you got to clean things up for Jesus first by attacking the nobles. And uh, peasant revolts start breaking out all over Germany. Uh, initially, um, uh, 
some of them uh, start writing confessions of faith and they draw on Luther. And one of the things that Luther talks about all the time is Christian freedom. So they hear the word freedom and they're like, oh, okay, well this must mean political freedom, right? The, the uh, Junkers are giving us a raw deal. That's the, that, if you don't know, that's the, the noble class in Germany. And so uh, Luther says the Bible gives us freedom. So God must then want us to have this political freedom. He must want us not to be squeezed by the Junkers. Now, uh, if you read Freedom of the Christian, that's not what Luther is talking about, of course, at all. He says the external person is always governed by the law. The inner person you know, is free in, in its conscience before God's uh, uh, condemnation. Okay? Um, but uh, when my wife, my wife actually had witnessed this sort of interesting exercise, she, she won this uh, really great scholarship from the National Endowment for the Arts uh, over Calvin. And they were um, these scholars from different um, colleges and universities from around the country who aren't Reformation scholars, but they teach classes on and dealing with the Reformation occasionally. Uh, and so she won the scholarship. And one of the things they read is Freedom of the Christian. And so this guy, David Whitford, who's a fairly famous Reformation scholar, taught him. And he said, um, uh, okay, uh, let, I want to go through you one by one. Why don't you explain to me what Luther means by Christian freedom in Freedom of the Christian, except for you, when you pointed at my wife. <laughs> Very flattering, uh, but anyway. <laughs> uh, and so they go through this, and nobody understood it. These are people with doctorates, so the people who are semi-literate aren't understanding what Luther's talking about. Um, it's not terribly surprising, okay? And so, uh, crying out Luther's cause, they then began this gigantic social revolution around about you know uh, 1524. In fact, the largest social revolution in um, uh, European history prior to the French Revolution. There's 300,000 peasants. Uh, fighting at one time, they're burning down people's uh, houses and um, you know stealing and raping and pillaging and so forth. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, this is just a disaster. It's a huge disaster for Luther because he's going to have a hard time getting the Junkers on on the side and then reforming the church if, he th if they think that this is what it gives rise to. So Luther, uh, t interestingly enough, and very faithful, time, he tries initially to write a number of pieces where he blames both sides. I think rather fairly. Uh, the Junkers were not treating the uh, peasants uh, fairly. Um, the peasants can't revolt since that's against Romans 13. Then, after the peasants stop listening to him, he's just he froze himself completely 100% on the side of the Junkers. After all, he's a pretty socially conservative guy, as were words of his parents. And he says, uh, it's your divine duty to hack and slay uh, the pe as many peasants as you conceivably can. Um, they are the agents of the devil, right? So. Um, uh, so uh, they do, and of course, uh, peace is restored. Though in the end, two interesting developments happened. The common people had generally been on Luther's side. They, they start cooling towards him a tad bit. And Luther then doesn't talk about Christian freedom anymore. The concept is there still, right, in Galatians commentary for 1530 and things like that. He doesn't like to use the word freedom anymore for a very good reason, right? In fact, he writes the treatise Bondage of the Bible. <laughs> in the middle of it in 1525, right? So he also, by the way, gets married in the middle of the Peasants' War, right? Because he says, well, this may be the, this may be the prelude to the Last Judgment, but in, um, uh, in, at the Last Judgment, God doesn't want to find me in some kind of hyper-spiritual state. What he wants me to find me doing is exactly what he commanded me to do, which is to be creaturely and do creaturely things. So uh, he famously says, uh, that he would like to be, let us say, in the act of marriage when the second coming happens. Right? <laughs> this is the first command that God gave us, right? So, um, as I have to remind some people. But anyways, um, anyways, okay, so uh, death and destruction. Munzer, of course, is, is captured, uh, and then he's, of course, he's, he's executed. Um, but, of course, there will be other um, peasant revolts and other uprisings by spiritualists as well, as we'll see uh, later on. Okay, meanwhile, to the south, okay. um, Luther gets into it with uh, Ulrich Zwingli, who also gives rise to what we would properly call the Anabaptist movement. But we'll talk about, we'll talk about Luther's debate with him intertwined, since it actually is related to Zwingli's debate with the Anabaptists. Um, which Lutheran, if you read Lutheran uh, histories of the Reformation, the, there's a really important series of episodes in the early 1520s between uh, Zwingli and the Anabaptists, but those just sort of go out the window. No one talks about them. And um, 
And then they just you know, go head on to his debate with Luther about the Lord's Supper, which is related, but um, it shouldn't be, the, 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 the debates with the Anabaptists shouldn't be actually ignoring. Okay, so Zwingli's dates are uh, 1484, so he's a year younger than Luther, uh, to uh, 1531. Uh, he comes from a middle class family and is able to pursue his education at the University of Geneva, excuse me, and the University of Basel in Switzerland as well. Uh, he gets a couple of master's degrees. He never earns a doctorate, something that Luther frequently reminded him of in the debates. <laughs> so, of course, you're, what you're saying is foolish. I mean, you don't have a doctorate. But, anyways. Uh, and his education is primarily humanistic, right? Although he does study scholastic theologians. Specifically, he studies. Uh, the theology of uh, Thomas Aquinas and uh, another Franciscan theologian named uh, John Don Scott Scotus. Uh, and I'd have to go into like lots of descriptions of medieval metaphysics. That would be an entirely different class. Um, but um, most modern Catholic theologians believe that John Don Scotus is the person who single-handedly ruined Western civilization. So if, I'm certain if you talked to Tony Esselon and asked him about Scotus, he'd be like, oh yeah, he ruined Western civilization. <laughs> So, um, because they think he taught something he didn't really teach, but again, that's it's an, it's an entirely different lecture. But anyways, uh, but here's the key. Then this is gonna be very interesting. Okay, so the key is, and he studied this guy, Thomas Wittenbach, who um, kind of synthesized some of their thought together. Um, the key here is that for Zwingli, <clears throat> um, when he thinks about faith and reason, he thinks about faith and reason as, in this way, that like Thomas Aquinas does. Thomas Aquinas would, would say, um, God is the author of our reason, but he's also the author of revelation, so we should be able to um, harmonize them perfectly. They should just fit like hand and glove together, okay? Now, uh, Luther doesn't think in those terms. He's, he, was, he, he studied uh, with nominalist theologians, who, as we remember, taught that God could just do anything, meaning he wasn't really bound by rationality. Rationality is fine, but rationality is for this world. Okay, it doesn't have anything to do with God, because what rationality does is it puts limits on things. Well, this can't be true because of this and this. It talks about boundaries. R rationality is all about boundaries. God doesn't have any boundaries. So, um, so Zwingli, when he comes to the question, let's say, of the Lord's Supper, he says, well, how does my human reason then har able to harmonize with what I found in the Word of God? Because they have to fit hand and glove together. Luther says, well, throw that out. Um, think about, uh, go and think back to the concept of the, the nominalists about the uh, covenant, okay? So to know what God will do, he binds himself to do specific things. Okay, we'll just look at what God has promised to do. And that's how you know. It doesn't matter how silly or absurd that you seem to think it is or pointless. It has to be because he says so. So that's how the issues are going to be dealt with. So uh, anyways, okay, so so you have Vienna, and he uh, gained this humanistic education. He accumulates in his lifetime about 350 books, which is a lot of books. He also uh, ended up uh, uh, borrowing far, many book, far more books uh, than that from uh, other people. Um, and after he gets through his education, he retires to a two-point parish in uh, a place called uh, Galeris in, in northern Switzerland, somewhat close to Zurich. And he spends his day reading constantly. He has to say mass once in a while, but that's really not much work. And there are many young women in his parish who he is very interested in, and so he spends his time engaged in dalliances with young women in his parish as well. So, uh, as well, uh, in fact, when he becomes uh, the people's priest in Zurich, um, the one of the local men said, "Well, he can't become the people's priest. He, uh, my my daughter was a virgin, and now I can't find a husband for her because he had his go over to her." And Zwingli said, "Well, she was." Uh, when I met her, okay, you know, she was one sort of person during the day, but that night she was a really different kind of person. So, anyways. And then I think, I believe he actually even posted a, a list of people, her lovers, like in, in a public place or something like that as well. So, anyways, so, uh, of course, his competitor was a priest who uh, was openly living with his girlfriend and had six children with her, so they decided on Zwingli instead. But, you know. <laughs> but uh, anyways, so there you go. Here's Zwingli's birthplace, by the way, it's still around. Okay, so uh, he spent all his time reading, uh, and uh, he uh, then eventually uh, comes upon a book called The Enchiridion for the Christian Soldier, 
uh, written by Erasmus. And this is about being, uh, it, Erasmus, uh, Red Caridian is a little uh, dagger, okay, so it's like a Swiss army knife, okay, so this is like practical Christian living is the idea. And Erasmus says, well, you should sort of, you should try to live a life of sober morality, and you should teach yourself the original languages of the Bible, so you can study the, language, the Bible in its original languages and study the church fathers. And Zwingli sort of feels really bad about all this sort of dalliances with the young women, and he repents, and then he throws himself into learning Greek and Hebrew, and then becoming this sort of very hyper-learned Christian humanist uh, sort of ideal. Um, so he gets this job then offer from Zurich, uh, which is the big city in the area, to become the, um, the city priest, it's called the people's priest. And he's able to get the job then, and he immediately sort of starts his uh, reforming activities. He uh, starts preaching through the different books of the Bible, using the original languages. He does Matthew and he does Jeremiah, and um, the people can't get enough of it. Remember, because they, again, want to hear learned preaching. There are these early modern business people, they can read, uh, they can study the Bible, and they find just the priest going up there and doing a bunch of rituals which they think are nonsense to be kind of boring. And uh, so what he does, Zwingli essentially develops is what is called expository preaching. This is a big thing in the Reformed tradition. You preach your way through a book of the Bible, uh, maybe not in, um, in kind of a lecture style. And the sermons go on for quite a while. Um, they go on for like three hours or something along those lines. So um, again, that's characteristic of the Reformed tradition. Uh, when we were in Lexington and Concord, they said that the morning church service was four hours during colonial times, and then you'd have a catechetical service, which was another four hours in the afternoon, three hours of which would be preaching, right? So, uh, or, or really a lecture, right? So, uh, in any case. He also, by the way, starts a club called Prophecy, which sounds like something that, I don't know, that some person on TBN came up with, right? I mean. Uh, you know, like uh, Hal Lindsey or something, but really it's just, um, it, it's just, it's a group of people uh, committed to studying the Bible in their original languages, so it's a, it's a Bible study group for people who have kind of a humanistic uh, inclination. So uh, that becomes very popular as well. Okay, so he starts, uh, he likes Luther, he thinks some of the things that Luther is doing are good, and he, it comes to a head, he starts implementing more and more sorts of reforms or preaching in favor of various reforms and it comes to a head over, over a conflict over eating meat during Lent. Now this is a practice uh, uh, of Catholicism before the Second Vatican Council uh, that you were not allowed to eat meat during Lent. That's why it's called carne vol, carnis meaning meat, right? So it's the last day for meat, right? So, um, all right, that's another name for Fat Tuesday, carne vol. But anyways, uh, the, uh, many of the people in his parish were uh, woodcutters and craftsmen, and you need a lot of strength to you know, cut down trees all day, okay? And they said, we can't just eat bread or fish or whatever. We need strength, we need meat uh, to be able to you know, do our job. And so he says, well, there's nothing in the Bible that says you can't eat meat during Lent. And so he goes to the house of one of them in the evening and watches them eat sausage. Now, he doesn't eat sausage himself, but he watches them eat sausage. Okay? And um, this ends up stirring a controversy with the local bishop, who starts condemning him. And in fact, he writes a, a whole treatise about this and says, okay, um, uh, you know, if the Bible doesn't explicitly say you have to do something, then you don't have to do it. The church just can't make up a bunch of rules. Uh, and, he, and he says, well, that's, that's you know, Christian freedom or something along those lines. Okay, so, um, so the local bishop then says to the town council, basically, either you sort of get rid of him or uh, you guys are all kind of in trouble. And uh, so Zwingli undertakes a series of disputations. Uh, now, I was, uh, I, I did, Luther versus Zwingli is one of my questions for my comprehensive exams in my doctoral program. And I tried to read them, I got about seven pages in. They're very, very boring, and I just decided that I didn't, for sure need this to pass the examination. I didn't, actually. So I stopped reading, but they're very boring. Uh, but uh, he convinces them in these, essentially these three uh, disputations to get on board with his reforming program, to throw off the shackles of the ro local Roman Catholic bishop, and they kind of, and they all agree to it. Uh, now this works because Switzerland is sort of, at this time, politically decentralized. It's a confederation. 
you have different city states, and they're kind of in a kind of pact with each other to defend each other, and they get invaded. In fact, the Holy Roman Emperor attempted to do so in the 1400s, and they were really successful at expelling them uh, because they used pikes, okay? You know, the long sticks. And, you know, you just knock, knock the knights right off their horses, and you're done, right? So they were, that's how they gained their independence. Um, uh, but they can do whatever they want to in their own little, what's called a canton, or their little city-state. And so they start implementing uh, the Reformation. Uh, and so Zwingli has a kind of a free hand. And so he begins a massive sort of campaign of iconoclasm, smashes all the statues, he has the churches whitewashed, gets rid of the organs because he thinks that that's kind of distracting, okay? Um, and uh, then does other things too. Like I said, he dissolves the monasteries, he forces, forces the monks and the nuns to get married to one another and then learn a trade so they can be productive citizens, right? Um, very similar actually to what the French revolutionaries did as well, so interestingly enough. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, clamps down on public morals and uh, things like this. Um, though he does actually live with a woman who he's not married to, so that's interesting. Innkeeper's daughter. It's kind of all. He eventually, I think, got married to her after he had a couple children with her. But anyways. Um, so what's going on here? It, now, it's, it, again, it's very interesting the contrast that you have with uh, Luther at, on these points. Um, now, um, Zwingli was essentially a kind of a bad person who thought he became a really good person by becoming a Christian, right? Which is, if you, if you look at the history of Christianity, an awful lot of people kind of think about their conversion in that sort of way. Um, in the case of Luther, of course, he was a, per a person who thought that he was doing his best and couldn't really um, become righteous, okay, and then felt that he had to just rely on the grace of God. So it sets up a very interesting situation um, where you have that now two kind of competing ideas about how the Christian life works and very and two competing ideas about what was wrong with medieval Catholicism. For Luther, the problem with medieval Catholicism is it doesn't give enough assurance, okay? It leaves you hanging there under the power of the law for you to, you know, do, you know, appease whatever saints or say whatever masses or whatever. Um, and what you need is assurance. So the key for Luther then becomes God becoming more um, uh, assured, uh, giving you more assurance, and that means becoming more tangible. The more tangible a thing is, the more more secure you can a thing is, and you can grasp onto it. So, uh, so hence Luther's view of the word and the sacraments. Uh, they they really do contain the grace of God. Why? Because so you can so faith can grab onto them, right? And you can have real assurance. Zwingli, by contrast, thinks the problem is this. Um, he has a different idea about what idolatry constitutes. So idolatry for Zwingli is a confusion of, of the temporal world with the eternal world of God, right? So the problem is images, the problem is God coming through physical things. In fact, as we'll see, it's, it's even a, kind of a problem for Zwingli that God became incarnate in Jesus, though he's willing to still affirm that one. Um, it's, it's, it's in many ways kind of anomalous in his, in his system. I mean, how do you affirm the incarnation if you really want to evacuate creation completely from God, right? It makes perfect sense with Luther because God comes to us only in physical things, right? So, um, so it's a really completely different conception. And so then also uh, with public order, like you, like the church really has this role in cleaning up the public order. This had been going on for a while in Switzerland. Um, there was a really kind of a big move to clean up public morals um, by the Swiss uh, and other uh, early modern towns. But nevertheless, mainly, um, Thinks that this is really kind of central to the Reformation. So, yes, go ahead. Is it is it true that um, uh, Zwingli um, believed that he had a vision from God that kind of communicated that he was to do this Reformation and God visited him in dreams? Oh, I, I I never heard that. Maybe that's true. I don't know. I never heard that. It would, I've heard it. I wasn't sure if it was true. Well, I mean, that would that would just uh, um, confirm Luther's suspicion of him, right? So. I mean, if he didn't, if he had had a doctorate, that wouldn't have happened. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, right? <laughs> when I first started studying all this stuff, I was uh, reading Luther's sacramental writings. I was kind of offended by the argument because I only had a master's degree at the time. And then, after I got a doctorate, it sounded like that argument. <laughs> 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 so, uh, anyways. 
Okay, so uh, all this iconoclasm is happening, and now he gathers around a ragtag group of individuals who, unbeknownst to him, become the beginning of the Anabaptist movement. Now there's again uh, different theories about how you get the Anabaptist movement. One theory is that it's, it's just pangenesis. In other words, uh, you have all this medieval heresy and medieval sectarianism just kind of lying dormant, and then the Reformation comes on the scene and everybody just springs into action. And there's truth about that. We've already seen these big out prophets rejecting infant baptism and uh, some of these other things. Other, the other theory is that really it all goes back to the people gathered around Zwingli. Okay, that's how you get the Anabaptist movement. It's still a point of debate. Uh, and these folks, the, the, these folks are the first ones to be identified really as, as Anabaptists per se. In fact, it's Zwingli um, coins the term Anabaptist. So Anabaptist means to re-baptize, right? Uh, so these people are Conrad Grebel, Felix Mainz, and then George or Georg uh, Blau, Blaurock. Okay? And uh, they're known as the Swiss Brethren. Now, they're the people who study with him uh, in these prophecy gatherings, and because they study the understood of the Bible in its original languages, um, they, they think that they find in there a precedent for rejecting infant baptism. Um, so uh, the, the problem arises, uh, so they're, they're kind of unhappy with Zwingli, they think he's not moving the reforms along quickly enough, and problems start arising with the, something called the uh, second disputation. Remember I said there were three disputations. The second one is held in uh, 1523, uh, and uh, Grebel uh, says, uh, you, you're not moving the reform of the mass along quickly enough. And uh, they uh, begin to uh, get annoyed with him. And uh, they begin, these folks start meeting in private um, and making contact with other reformers, Karlstadt, um, uh, Luther, and some other people to try to get some people on, on their side as well. So they can maybe bring in some of these big wigs uh, to go after uh, Zwingli, though none of them are into rejecting infant baptism, interestingly enough. Uh, and they come to the conclusion that infant baptism is illegitimate and that they're going to have to get Zwingli on board with, with this idea. Now, Zwingli knows that the city government isn't going to go along with rejecting infant baptism. That's just a bridge too far for them. And he's famously known for sort of fudging things theologically if it's politically expedient to him. Uh, as we'll see, the only thing, uh, he, Luther got him basically to agree to everything except for the real presence, and a whole bunch of the things that Luther got him to agree with he absolutely didn't believe in, such as uh, confession and absolution and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, but he was willing to, to, to uh, at least, you know, fudge things a bit. But um, even if Zwingli had come to the conclusion that infant baptism um, was a bad idea, uh, he probably would have just kept on doing it for the sake of expediency. So um, Zwingli, uh, in the third disputation, he supports infant baptism, and he rejects his old friends, and uh, he calls them now Anabaptists, tells them that they have to get, accept infant baptism or get out of the city in eight days, or things are going to get bad. So he has no problem. Uh, using coercive power against them. In fact, he thinks the state and the church are really kind of the same thing, and so uh, he has no trouble using violent means against uh, heretics, people who think they were heretics. And all. So, uh, so uh, at home, Felix Mainz, uh, Blaurock, and Grebel um, get together, and they start baptizing each other. Uh, they baptize by pouring the pouring of water, and there's no uh, priest present. They think that this is sort of somehow uh, more authentic. Uh, they st start spreading their beliefs to the villages around Zurich, which of course enrages the, uh, in the Zurich um, authorities. And uh, then they get into really big trouble with Zwingli. So they develop another a series of other beliefs. So first of all, uh, what's the church? Well, the church is the gathering of all believers, but uh, the gathering of all believers, when they come together, they come together and they say, oh, well, we all agree on the same thing, so let's make a covenant to each other that we're going to enforce church discipline on one another, okay? And this is a very interesting conception. This carries over into, these people are not, of course, identical with our modern Baptist, but this carries over into the modern Baptist tradition as well. For a modern Baptist, the idea is sort of that you, off by yourself somewhere, are reading the Bible, you come to the conclusion that Christianity is somehow true, 
and then you go seeking out other people who also have come to the conclusion that Christianity is true, and then you covenant with each other, and then as a way of showing that you've covenanted with each other, that you're going to enforce discipline on one another, uh, you all get baptized, you know, to publicly affirm that you're, going to, you're willing to do this. Um, and remember all the famous passages in the New Testament which support this view, right? <laughs> Not really. But I mean, they don't have any, I mean, with their conception of faith, they don't really actually have, I mean, they have, they, they, if you think about it, there's no purpose to any of the sacraments anymore. So it's like, hmm, now what, if we don't have any purpose for the sacraments, what could a possible purpose of the sacraments be? Oh, maybe it's to publicly.